Dr. Paul Dyer, Bridges Live, and you will come up on the show. I'll be talking with Mr. James Spearman. And you can also see this on my YouTube channel, um, Grandmaster Dyer or Dr. Paul Dyer. You can get it there too. And on Facebook and so on and so on, blah, 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 social media crap, right? Because we want to talk to Mr. James Spearman. I do a lot of shows. Most people know I do a lot of stuff with domestic abuse, how to heal yourself through emotional intelligence, combat related incidents, um, legal issues. James, this, you are breath of fresh air. First, tell all my audience of Bridges Live about you so we can get right into this interview. Sure. My name is James Spearman. I am. Um... Originally born and raised in Washington, D.C., currently live in Annapolis. I'm a retired 33-year veteran in that city police department. I was a crisis negotiation team leader. I was a crisis interventionist um, specialist, uh, field training officer, uh, retired as the midnight watch commander. And uh, I do a lot of work in the community. I'm a member of the Caucus of African-American Leaders here in Annapolis. And I am a member of Brandon's Coalition for Success, where we mentor uh, young, uh, young, children, young people from the ages of 8 to 18 to help them make better choices in life. Um, I also, before the pandemic, I was coaching football and basketball and doing another uh, number of other things in the community, trying to make our situation better. You know, just from what you said, basically, it's not it's it's not easy to do, to do what you have done, but you have put your foot in the community. That's what you have done your whole life. You have yeah. said, I have to be part of something. Mm -hmm. I have to build something. I want to be part of the growth of something and for it to happen, not the way I want it to, but to be part of it, I have to be in it. Yes. The, so as a young boy, I mean, you don't look all that old, but <laughs> but is it? But you've been retired like four times already. Retired from this, retired from that. So, how did you start becoming so aware that you had to make a difference? Like, what what was the inception of Mr. James Spearman? Like the young C growing out in Washington D.C. dark country, say I gotta make a difference. Well, um, I come from a police family. My um, oldest brother was a detective. He retired from uh, New York City Police Department. And um, I have cousins and uh, other family members who are in law enforcement. I have another cousin in, who retired as a captain. And uh, But for me personally, I was about 14 years old. And my friends and I were outside of an elementary school playing basketball. And uh, about four, all of a sudden, about four or five white cops pulled up on us. And they stopped the game and they asked us to line up. And they wanted to, um, they wanted to know what we were doing and uh, why we were there. And I said, well, we're playing basketball. So they searched us and uh, they, uh, took our names and everything, and then eventually they just said, well, someone broke into the school, and we wanted to see the bottom of your shoes to see if you guys were the suspects. So um, they were rude. They were aggressive. They didn't handcuff us or anything, but uh, we were kids. Uh, we were 14 and under, you know, and that was my first uh, direct uh, interaction with a police officer. And um, other than the officer friendly program in DC, but as far as being treated as a suspect, that was my first interaction. So when I went home, you know, I was, oh, I'm going to tell my daddy, you know, and I, I went home and I, and I told my father and I told him everything that I just told you. And he was sitting there reading the paper and he looked down at me over his glasses and he said, are you going to be part of the problem? Or are you going to be part of the solution? And I said, that's it. And he said, yeah. He said, are you going to be part of the problem? Are you going to be part of the solution? He said, anybody can sit there and just whine and, and complain, but what are you going to do about it? So I sat back and I thought about it over dinner. I came back to him and I said, well, I think I want to be a police officer. And he said, wise choice. So um, went to school for two years and run a community college um, for criminal justice. And I was hired as a cadet at the age of 20 uh, with Annapolis City. And um, 
until I turned 21. Then I um, graduated from the Baltimore County Police Academy. And then uh, the re remainder of my career in Napa City went from there. You know, this it's 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 not an uncommon story of what you said. And I didn't have a dad living with me, but my mother, it happened to me also the same incident. We were in New York, I'm a New Yorker growing up and some, they had pulled us as cousins walking over. It was a bunch of us cousins walking. And the my old, I was nine at the time when this first, the first incident happened and it still sticks out, right? Mm -hmm. And I did come home and my mother said, so what are you going to do next? Yes. That was my mother's statement. She always used to say, what are you going to do next? Now, we, we were very much an activist growing up. And I understand your point of take. Like, what are you going to do now? From that moment, did you start to see your community different or did you start to see yourself being different? You mean once I became police officer? No, be, when you said at that moment. When you say I, I'm going to be part of the solution. When I be, decided to become part of the solution, all of the teachings that I had growing up um, came into play. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I grew up studying Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey. Um, Harry Tubman, Frederick Douglass. Um, that was mandatory reading. That was mandatory teaching in my household. Um, and uh, we had to learn about Black inventors. We had to learn about people like Dr. Charles Drew. I had to write an essay mm. on Dr. Charles Drew. And one of the famous, one of my favorite stories that I like to tell both Black kids and white kids, if it wasn't for Dr. Charles Drew, there's, there's a good chance that you might not be alive today because of what he did during World War II. And that always catches people by surprise. And- um, You know, so I, just a side note about the Dr. Charles George, um, by, by Dr. Drew, is that I'm on the board of American Red Cross for a couple of counties, for um, yeah. Montgomery, Howard, and Frederick. And I've said this repeatedly, that when black people don't donate black blood, it is the original black on black crime because people with sickle cell anemia need black blood. They cannot curtail a crisis. They'll die if they don't have black people donating black blood. And black people are the lowest percentage of donors of when it comes to giving blood. And we need it. And it yeah. doesn't matter how much I scream from the mountaintops that if you choose not to donate your blood, you're literally killing three people. Yes. You don't have to pull a trigger. You don't have to rob anybody. But if you don't donate, because and because we're so far behind of the pandemic of people donating through work or so many so other cases, that you have to go to blood drives. And if you have any blood drives, you want to know where, you can contact me after the show. You can contact me at Dr. Paul W. Dyer, Gmail, and that's fine. But going back to being part of the problem, you're right. When you write that paper, you make a difference. Yes. Yes. Do you think everyone in the police force feels like they're making a difference? Do you, it's hard for you to speak about everyone, and I don't want you to, because it, it's tough because everyone's an individual, but yet mm -hmm. you're, you're on a unified force. But because of so much, we have a displacement against the police. Where, yeah. do you, where do you think that comes from? Um, going back to the original question, um, and I can speak for myself as well as a lot of other officers. When you go into the police department young, you got to remember, I was 21 years old. So I really knew nothing about life outside of my own community and outside of my own family. And I went in there with my own set of ideals thinking I'm going to go save the world. And... Um, you learn real quick that, that that's not really going to happen in the criminal justice system. And, uh, and then you start, start to realize that, uh, everything doesn't, it is, everything isn't peaches and cream and everything is not black and white. Um, just because, you know, somebody committed a crime, there's a difference between knowing they committed it and being able to prove it. And that's the essence of being in, in, in the middle of the criminal justice system. What can you prove? 
And um, <clears throat> all of these things are connected. All of these things are uh, working against themselves. Um, so when you have uh, police officers who bring their own set of ideals, their own set of morals into a neighborhood that they're not connected to, and when they bring their own sense of um, moral compass and right and wrong into that community and they try to impose that on that community without trying to get to know the needs of the people who live there, you're going to have conflict and you're, you're working against your own interests because those officers are not going to gain the trust of the community and you can't get anything done without that trust. You're not going to get the information you need to be able to prove the crime that someone has committed. When you were when you were a, when you were an active officer, how did you gain the trust of the community? By going out and speaking to people, getting to know people. I lived here a long time, so I knew a lot of people um, early on. So um, as I got out and I started to meet more and more people, uh, I tried to be professional. I tried to be fair. I tried to give people an out. Um, I, I didn't try to impose my will on others or my authority on others. Um, I pretty much let uh, whomever I had an interaction with, I pretty much let pretty much um, decided that I'm going to let them dictate how this interaction is going to be. What are some of the things you think we're missing as far as the communication between police officers and the community? Because there is a disconnect between police officers and the community? Or is it the police policy and the community? I think it's uh, police culture. Okay. I think a, a lot of it comes from training. Uh, I think some of the training is outdated. I think the uh, uh, there's a number of factors. Uh, policy is definitely one. Uh, culture is the biggest one. Um, and uh, not understanding the needs of the community as it relates to crime. So how do we change that when we either coming up to a pinnacle or we're all about ready to crack here in our community, here in your community, here in a multitude of communities around the country, it's about ready to feel like it's about ready to crack. Yes. Well, as I said, everything is all connected. I mean, the, 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 the politics that's going on across our nation has created a huge divide and, it's, and all of the things that are going on now are nothing but an extension of that. Uh, you have um, two extremes uh, going against each other and no one's meeting in the middle to be reasonable or logical in finding out what the best solution is on, under these circumstances. Um, as far as the black black community is concerned, um, too many too many needs are not being met that are not not an actual police problem. But the problem is the police officers don't understand. Well, a lot of police officers don't understand that even though it's not your job to handle a social issue, it would be good as a community um, gatekeeper to provide resources whenever you can. During the course of my career, I've gotten homeless people um, shelter. I've gotten them, I've, I've paid for people to stay in hotels when they didn't have the money. I've gotten people housing. Um, I've gotten families together. I've uh, gotten husbands and wives who were separated back together in the, in the, um, uh, in the performance of a police officer's duty. No, that's not really my job. But if you want to make your community better, you have to get it where you fit in and you try to help people where you can. And if I have a contact or if I have someone that I can reach out to to help somebody, why wouldn't I do that? There, I, I had um, recently I came in contact with a homeless person and I, I, I work at a, a club early morning. I teach a boxing class and there's a homeless person that sleeps in one of the hallways. Mm -hmm. And I called the Howard County um police department they said it's not their problem yes and that's how they feel it's not my it's not our problem yes i had a, i actually had a confrontation with one of my supervisors at um he looked at me and he said spearman he said 
as soon as you get to understand that we are a law enforcement agency and, and that that's social services, workers, yeah. we'll get along a whole lot better. And I said, well, sir, with all due respect, you and I are never going to get along. You know, I understand there's a lot of mental health issues. I we we yes. as as the as the educated community, <laughs> we understand there's a lot of mental health issues. We also understand there's a lot of domestic issues. And domestic yes. issues are mental health issues. Yes. And I've said this on some of my other shows, you know, I'm gonna call mental health Mondays, is that I believe the black community needs therapy and i think everyone every black person man woman and child should have a therapist and have the therapist check them out to say bop them on the head and say you're good to go here's your checkup because we're traumatized by things we are not speaking about things yeah. things we hold deep with inside ourselves and it comes out only when it blows Yes. And a lot of people say, oh, I can handle that, or I got I got a handle on it. I don't need this. I, I'm telling you, I've been doing this a long time. There's things that there's time for you to express yourself. And if you don't express yourself in a safe setting, it's going to come out in an unhealthy way. And that's when the police are going to be involved. And that's when it's going to look like a chaos mess. Is that what you found to be true, too? Absolutely, absolutely. You, you're whole, you're 100 correct. Um, and <laughs> one of the things that uh, that kind of struck me was that um, the black female is the number one uh, person or type of person who is in need of mental health, and they are the ones who refuse it the most as well. They are least likely to get mental health uh, services than any other classification. And the bulk of uh, the head of households are females. So you can see how those two dynamics will work against each other. And they're gonna spill over into these types of uh, settings. You know, the, you have women who are growing up with trauma. They go from relationship to relationship and those, those um, traumas just pile on each other and they manifest over into the children if they have any, and then later on the grandchildren. So you have that domino effect. You know, before we get a lot of um, email and text saying, you just, you, a lot of black women gonna jump on top of your head like a rooster. Like, how dare you say that? <laughs> <laughs> but but well, I, hold I mean, on. I, but I wasn't I, trying to be offensive. I was, I, I just want them, I want them to realize that it's okay uh to seek help everybody needs help uh, um, everybody has issues that they need to deal with it doesn't mean that you're certifiable right. it just means that um sometimes there there are things that go on in your life that 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 manifest themselves in, in the wrong way and uh they should be dealt with and and you also got to think of your physical health in addition to your your mental mental health because you have high blood pressure you have stress you have diabetes i mean um, the statistics speak for themselves. Our women are number one in breast cancer and, and all of these things. Do you I, want our, I want our community to be uh, healthy and safe. And, and uh, if we don't address these things, we're going to continue having the same problem. Do you think this is caused by lack of good black men or men abusing the black woman? No, I think it goes deeper than that. Oh, I okay. think the um, I think because because the system of uh, slavery, mm -hmm. Jim Crow, uh, public assistance, all of those things that have uh, manifest themselves in our community to devalue men and to demasculate men. Um, we're the number one uh, victims of homicide. We're the number one uh, perpetrators of violent crime. And um, so from a female standpoint, what does a good black man look like? What that's a great segue into mentorship. Yes, sir. If we don't look back, reach back, pull up, put our hand out, then it is our fault as adult men. And I have said this before, and I mentor men with 100 black men of uh, black men of Maryland and mm -hmm. other fraternities. 
that I believe, in, and I'm mid fifties, that we, by the time we turned around and looked behind us, they were so far gone. They had their pants is hanging down. Literally, by the time I turned around, it seemed like, where did your pants go? Like, how did it get there? Because that's not part of even hip hop. That's part of the jail culture. It is. It is. Part of the problem that we um, that we face, there's been a lot of uh, paradigm shifts that have occurred in the black community that so many of us are not paying attention to. Um, going back to early on when we started talking about uh, black men and what a good black man look like. Uh, back in the day when you were a high school athlete, whether it be football or basketball or anything else, um, our men were uh, trying to get scholarships so they can go to college. Mm -hmm. If they made it to the pros, they made it to the pros. If they didn't, they didn't. But the number one goal was to be able to get into a prestigious school to get that degree. So you could go on to be doctors and lawyers or Indian chiefs or doc, you know, whatever, teachers, principals, um, whatever, whatever profession that you chose to um, so, uh, to seek. Um, but now the paradigm shift is all of the young athletes, they want to go to the pro and they, and they don't care about the education. They don't care about um, getting into that school other than being able to have the ability to play on the big stage in a D1 school and um, somehow make it to the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball. They don't think about education. They don't, uh, they don't think about the future. They live for now. You know, I, I, I've taught really so much about the percentage. And when we talk about the percentage of who is going to make it, who is not going to make it, you're nowhere in the idea that you're going to make it. The percentage is not there. So we have to teach people that it's better to be part of the solution than to be part of the problem. Now, yes. as a police officer, that's a that's a that's a hefty dynamic for you to do. Is that possible? Absolutely. Once again, it, it goes down to um, building relationships. Um, when you're out patrolling, when you're out in the neighborhood, you should be making contact with people, uh, talking to them. Uh, it can start off with playing with the kids, buying them ice cream. You can talk to the parents. Um, as they get to know you, just, then they get to see past the badge, past the uniform, and get to be able to see you as a human being, they respond to you uh, differently. And um, one of the stories that comes to mind that I, I told people, uh, I realized as I got older, the uh, young kids called me Uncle Jimmy. And then the not so young kids called me Mr. Jimmy. And the old folks called me whatever they felt like at the time. <laughs> and so having that, that popularity made my job easy. Um, I've had kids who were doing things they had no business doing try to run from me. And I would say, hey, such and such, tell your mother I'll be around there in a couple of hours. And they would turn around and stop me. Go, oh, man, you didn't have to say that. Well, you shouldn't have run. You know, um, it's it's uh, mental health is a, is a um, is a tough nut to crack. And from the standpoint of the fact that it's being overlooked, um, it's always an afterthought after something bad happens. Um, to give you an example of how, how frustrating it, it is, I had a young man who uh, went up to my squad car and just started beating and banging on it. And he was cussing me out and I told him to cut it out, go away. And he refused to, and I ended up having to arrest him. Um, Put him in handcuffs, put him in the back of the car. I drove him to the police station, got him out of the car, took him inside. The minute I took the handcuffs off, he turned around and fell into my arms and started crying. And I said, why did you do all of that? And he said, because I need to talk to you, but if I let anybody see me talking to you, they will label me as a snitch. I don't have a father, I don't have a grandfather, and everybody seems to respect you. And I just need some help. And I just want to, I just want to be able to uh, just sit and talk. And, and, and I didn't know what else to do. 
We are, like I said before, we are in a situation that just seems like we're about ready to crack. And mm-hmm. if we if we don't mend this, we can mend the crack. We we don't we, but we've been trying to patch it up for the last twenty five years. Yeah, that's why I call it the patch. We need mm-hmm. to mend the crack. What are some of your ideas of ways that you can see that we can mend this crack between an us and them mm-hmm. <laughs> mentality? Because the us and them keeps growing and it turns into a, a civil war. Yes. Um, that's a tough question because there are a lot of things that can be done and, and, and on our end and, and there are things that, that has to be done on on their end. I think um, professionals in our community need to step up and A, mentor. I always, uh, when I get around men, I always try to tell them and I always try to to encourage them to mentor. Each one teach one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it doesn't cost that much. Sometimes a a kid uh, only needs uh, five or 10 minutes of your time. You know, as I mentioned, Brandon, Brandon's in Davidson and uh, he's student body president, second year going. He's got a a 3.8 I think GPA may be higher than that. He's going to kick me. It might be 3.9. I don't know. But anyway, I talk to him twice a week. He's a grown man. He's 21 years old. But guess what? He still calls me. He still seeks my advice. He still takes the time to say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Or how do you feel about that? You know, and we have to learn to listen. Um We can't just talk at them. We have to listen to them to see what their problems are and see what it is that they're facing. Um, They have the pressures of social media. They have the pressures of, uh, they don't have the leniency and and, and the leeway that you and I had. You know, it's easier to get kicked out of school than it is to stay in. Um, When when we were in school, it took an act of Congress for us to be (laughs) suspended. Now all you have to do is uh, one little thing. uh, one of the kids that we were mentoring, he got he got expelled from school for carrying a knife to school. Um, now, on the surface, that sounds horrid that he would bring a knife to school. Well, he got jumped five times by some rival kids, and it was like three or four of them, and he wasn't that big to begin with. So if he's going to continue to go to school, what would you think he's going to do? He's going to do what he thinks he needs to do to defend himself. Now, that's not to say that that was the best choice, but you can't argue the the logic of self-preservation. So there are a lot of things that need to happen in our community that we need to work on. Um, The other thing is that we need to hold law enforcement executives accountable. Um, We we need to be holding our, um, our political officials accountable. Uh, we can't wait. We we have a very bad habit of waiting until the tragedy begins before we address it. Before we open our mouths. Yes. Um, you were a training officer for several years. Yep. And I'm a training when it comes to tactical combat. I just, I'm not going to get into my own. I believe training and training and training and training like not reaction. There's a difference. Yes. Training is different than reaction. And the way you can train it, it's not so much. That's why I, you see things as mo- emotional reaction trainer, because if you train on only your emotions and feelings, you're going to only react without thinking. We need cognitive reaction. Yes. Right. Not yes. the amygdala reaction where it's survival or flight. Because if you if you work back into the brain mechanism and you only go into survival reaction, the mm-hmm. outcome is always bad. Yes, sir. If you go into cognitive reaction, then the outcome is always thought out and is understood, and you've weighed your options. And can you can you do it in nine seconds? Absolutely. Yes. But here's the Absolutely. thing. It takes training. It does. Throughout the country, police officers, as you know, and you've probably met tons of police officers in your life, Mm -hmm. the training is completely different. 
Yeah. It is absolutely almost like, what do you guys do? <laughs> you know, yeah. like you talk to someone from another state, another county, another place. They're like, and how do you guys handle that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It absolutely. is. It's it's fascinating. So that's an issue. Huge. It's a huge issue. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it comes down to budget and a lot of it comes down to the size of the agencies and a lot of it comes down to the amount of crime that um that occurs um we always think that some of these small towns oh nothing ever happens here so why should we bother with that uh, we don't have those kinds of problems nothing ever happens like that here so why you know what is the point so that's why this uh, the trend the uh, training that law enforcement uh, officials get it should be um, by state by state um, standardized. Every every state should have their own set of standards. And then when you get to other things that are universal, like use of force and things of that nature, which could be uh, universal, is universal. Um, that should be mandated uh, all across the country. Do you think it sh you think training should be federal, like federalized, like? Like the military, you know, if you train in Kentucky or you train in California, you get the same training in your basic training. Well, that would be difficult because mm -hmm. all states don't have the same problems. All states don't face the same types of issues. You know, um, Annapolis is huge for heroin and PCP. But when you go into other parts of the country, they don't even know what PCP is. But you go down to uh, Arizona, they're huge in meth, they're huge in marijuana because they're a border state. So it would have to be based on the needs of each individual state and what type of crime or what type of issue that they face um, more frequent, more frequently. You know, now I, I don't want to get into the fairy tale land. And, I, and as far as the people who are watching, the people who are on the Zoom call, thank you. If you have any questions, I'm going to end up opening up questions in, in the next five minutes. The, I, I, can there be a basic training that all officers go through that is just a basic standardized training, and then go into your subsequent training depending on the area or the state you live in can, could, is that possible because, absolutely because right now it's not no absolutely okay absolutely uh, yes i mean um the law is still the law right um, you know um and uh except in texas <laughs> just the law is the law except in texas or mississippi yeah yeah, yeah. the law is the, per the person yeah. holding the badge yes i'm not, it's just the truth because yeah i agree i know because i've gotten pulled over in texas and he says i'm the law yeah. all right <laughs> it, is true. It, is true. it is true yeah but again it still goes back to we as a community, are we going to start holding these police chiefs and these sheriffs accountable for the um, behavior and the professionalism or lack thereof of the men and women that work for them? What, what are they doing uh, as far as that culture is concerned? Um, there's a culture in, in policing uh, that creates, that fuels these, these types of incidents. Um, you have officers that think that they're supposed to act a certain way so they can be accepted among their peers. And um, peer pressure in law enforcement is real. You know, no matter where you are, you want to be accepted among the people that you see day in and day out. So it's it's incumbent upon those managers and those leaders to determine what that culture is going to be. You know, I, I, I just, we just know no other culture that's, a professional culture like the police department that has never had a good light on it. It's never had a good light from the Serpical days to the French connection to any movie you've ever seen. It's always been about that one particular outstanding cop with a bad force behind it. It has always been talked about. We have made the movies. We've written the books. And it still never got cleaned up. I've heard of so many stories out of New York where a cop didn't want to take a bribe and he ends up getting left out there on a call where he gets no backup. 
and he gets quote unprotected and yeah. and people still believe that bad police officers shoot them you know what i mean it's just it's it's a it's a place why people go in there with that knowledge saying i still want to make a difference when i walk the beat yeah you, it that's that's amazing well that happens more uh, more often than not in your larger agencies um you know you the um, agencies that and that police those areas like Chicago, Baltimore, New York, Boston, uh, places like that where you have thousands and thousands of officers um, and they're trying to fit in, they wanna make a name for themselves. And uh, the culture is so large that they get, uh, they get caught up, they get engulfed. And uh, a lot of the problem comes down to uh, it comes down to politics. It comes down to management. You have um, you have police executives who go from one agency to another. Um, like uh, Commissioner Harris Harrison came from New Orleans and now he's here in Baltimore. Well, he doesn't have those deep roots in Baltimore because he's not from Baltimore. He's from New Orleans. Um, Chief Ramsey was at D.C., he was in Philly, and I think somewhere else. So they're not going to have those deep ties to the community. I do. I have friends and family and uh, uh, people that I respect and who I, who I care. I care more about what they think of me than trying to fit in with that culture. It, and uh, it is, I have that support. It is hard to do politics in the street. I don't understand why politicians think that politics work in the street. It's almost like in, in the military, the suits are in there making what they believe is an idea, but there's only so many boots on the floor, on the ground, that's going to execute it. And it doesn't work. That's because the boots on the, the people who are the boots on the ground are not given the opportunity to provide the input um, because, uh, one of the, the, the issues that we have in law enforcement, one of the reasons why there's such a great divide is because the law enforcement community has not adjusted to the modern uh, problems and issues that are occurring in the street. It's, it's, way more, uh, more, it's way more deeper than just crime and drugs and, and uh, things that are going on. Uh, we're not even, we're not even, we were so long and so slow in recognizing that drug problems were manifested off of mental health and social issues more so than the crime. And having those plans where we want to start locking up all the bad guys and putting everybody in jail who sold drugs, um, it worked against itself because you never really solved the problem. The only thing you did was put a lot of people in jail because those people who are hooked on drugs are hooked on drugs and they're going to do whatever it is. Uh, they're going to do whatever it is they got to do to maintain that, that habit. Um, locking up the drug dealer is not going to stop someone who's addicted to heroin or marijuana or cocaine or crack or whatever the person's addicted to. It doesn't matter who they get it from. You know, good cops, bad cops, cops who die as a lifelong police officer family of police officers, it must really hurt a lot when a bad cop co happens and a cop gets killed. That's a good cop that gets killed because they're still hunting cops out here. Yes. Yes. Well, um, at the end of the day, we, um, I can't speak for other agencies, but, um, from studying officers losing their lives in the line of duty, about 80 to 85 percent of the time when an officer loses his life in the line of duty is because he didn't follow his training. Um, that's not as a judgment. That's just it just was it. It is, it, it is what it is. Uh, we are trained to perform a certain way in the street. We have standard operating procedures that we have to follow for a variety of reasons. Um, but we always try to put officer safety 
as paramount, not because our lives are more important than the civilian's life. It's because if you're calling me for help and I do something to get hurt, I'm not, I'm no good to you. If I, if I need to get to you to help you and I get hurt by not doing what I'm supposed to do, I'm no good to you. I'm going to open the floor up for questions. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand up. If it's in the Zoom, if it's in the Facebook, you can put it in Facebook and I will read it. If it's in YouTube, you can put it in the YouTube box and I will read it. Does anyone have any questions right now for Mr. James Spearman? Mr. Brandon, please. Oh, before you speak, is it a 3.8 or a 3.9? Uh, in between. Right there in the middle. Okay. What's your yeah. question, sir? So, um, appreciate you, Sarge. You know, everything you've done for me. Appreciate you um, sharing your thoughts today. The question I had was, so we talk about this a lot. What role can law enforcement play in preventing recidivism? People coming out of prison and going back. Well, one of the things that they can do is they can, um, <clears throat> create uh, programs where uh, they can connect with members of the clergy. They can commit, connect with uh, uh, mental health uh, facilitators and um, <clears throat> help uh, use their resources to uh, get people employment and try to uh, put them in a situation where they can succeed. Oftentimes when police, uh, when uh, people are released from prison, they're sent right back out into the street. And I always equate that with locking somebody up for DWI. And when you, when you release them, you drop them right back off in front of the bar, bar. Mm -hmm. and then want to know why they're still drunk. So unless we start putting resources in place where, um, where people can succeed, they're going to continue to fail. And, and we don't address the addiction um, that's going to play heavily in, into their decision making and eventually they're going to commit a crime or they're going to violate their probation or their parole and end up going right back. Brandon, I actually have a question for you. Can you hear me, Brandon? The, the question I have for you is that we have a lot of programs out here. We have a lot of mentorship out here. We have this probably not a this. You could probably throw a rock and hit a hit a service that's going to serve you in some form or way. And even if you did not know where to get services, there are usually these big buildings with these crosses all over them that says, hey, I need help. And they have access to service. My question is to you, Brandon, if a person refuses service, what do you think we should do to them? Service in what aspect? Can you give an example? No, like a person, like a drug addict. He refuses to get oh, okay, services. Okay. He, he, okay. he doesn't want to stay in a program. And what, what do you think we should do to that person who doesn't want to stay in a program? Well, I, I mean, I'm no expert, so. No, no, no. It's just, uh, I just want your thoughts. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I guess in an ideal world, drug addiction is a mental health problem if the person is not willing to support themselves and they are deteriorating their health by making poor decisions maybe the state could step in and say you need to be placed into this treatment mm -hmm. facility involuntarily that's that's touchy and i'm going to let you stop there before you put your foot in a rabbit hole the reason why that's tough is because once we start forcing people into programs without their will, then we start making decisions for them. Then you're around taking away someone's amendment rights. You know what I mean? I actually, oh, yeah, I, understand I actually agree. I understand. I understand what you're trying to say, and it's not a bad idea. And I think that's where civil liberties come in, and that's tough. But it, yeah, it, it's that's a tr it was a trick question, and, and it, 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 it's not just an yeah. easy answer. But I'm glad you're thinking. Because it is, it is, it, it, James, is it right? It's a community issue. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think what Brandon was, was saying is that um, you want to try to put the person in a position where they could get some mental, mental health services. And if you can address those mental health services, maybe that addiction won't be so important and it, and it won't be so 
and, and cumbersome on, on the individual. Um, because a lot of times when a person is addicted, they think that that's their only escape mm -hmm. and their only way out. And that's one of the problems that we face in the black community. We're not presenting enough options to people. You, uh, one you, thing, go ahead, Brandon. One thing I was thinking when answering your question is if someone's having a problem with drugs, <clears throat> why are we able to take their liberty away by throwing them in prison? But we can't put them into a program that would look out for their mental health. That's where it was going through my head. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions we have for Mr. James Spearman? Yes. Orly. Orly, did I pronounce it right, sir? Please, you can unmute yourself. Okay. There, there you go. It, what's your, pronounce your name, sir? Orly. Orly. O -L -I -E. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, sir, for coming on. What's your question? Yes, yes, I have a, a point and a question. Um, I'd like to take that question you asked Brandon, because oh. I've been a psychotherapist for 45 years with a private practice. There's a lot of things that are illusionary as it relates to helping people. We've got to begin to look systematically at the steps we take to Help enable them. people to feel worse. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is cognitive training going to get us to the place that there's an empath empathic feeling about people to the extent that it motivates caring and sensitivity? Mm -hmm. Is it or because it, it, the answer is yes. I don't agree with that. How so? Please explain. I don't agree because cognitively is an illusionary approach to make people think something is happening that isn't unless there's an interactional relationship. Very seldom do, do people understand people to the extent that there's empathy and caring. True. But if you change the if you change the actions <clears throat> of the different firing of the synapses, because right now a lot of people fire on the, what you call they never develop cognitive, uh, they they never develop cognitive dissonance. So they was never as a young child they were never a lot of black people were never taught how to think. Right. They were taught to they were taught to listen, but not how to think. And that's why there's a difference between cognitive issues and trauma issues and how it's related in the brain. That's so once you teach people how the trauma is related into their body, chemically, you can teach them how to think cognitively. And so they can think into the four front four frontal lobes of their brain, because right now a lot of blacks live in survival. You can't live in survival. You can only survive in survival. I don't believe that I've cognitively helped anybody. And uh, I say this with all sincerity mm -hmm. because I understand that there's something that's much more systemic that right. we need to be careful about. True. And need to work toward. That's the way it is. And you're not wrong. And until we get and, until people understand their <clears> own <throat> systemic and and that's a and that's a journey of that is an educational journey per person because I think still people live in their own systemic trauma. You're and I think that's you're correct about that. That's why I believe that's a, that's that a lot of people don't. And I said this earlier in the show. I think a lot of black men, women, children need to go to therapy so they can be understood that maybe they're not as healthy as they would like. It's almost like a car checkup. Go get checked up and say, hey, doc, or whatever. This is what I'm thinking. This is how I think. And this is how I process my life. Well, I can see where you're having some this or that. Because there's a lot of things. People do things on the reverse of trauma. Like, I grew up really poor. I'll never want to be poor again. It's great that you developed hard work, but you're really in a reaction against you being poor as a, as a young child. That's not growth, that's a reaction.
Mr. Orley? <clears throat> well, I think, I think that um, uh, my point is, and it's been since I've been in this field, that uh, the problem, if we're not careful, we're going to blame the victim. We're going to say that you should take advantage of this program. If, if, you, don't, if you don't, then something's wrong with you. Mm. which is not true. It's not true. There's something wrong with us who's trying to enable that person mm -hmm. through a process that works. Yeah. That's I, the way it is. I agree. Do you have any questions for Mr. James? <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've asked him every question in the world already. We're friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for James at all? We have another one over here, actually. Brandon, you got like a car full of people. Right. You got questions coming out of your ears. What's going on? Yeah. This is my buddy John. He's also from Maryland. Uh, he has a question. Uh, yeah, I just I'm listening, to, uh, Brandon. First of all, thank you for coming to speak today. Um, question is, I'm curious to hear when you hear statements like defund the police or statements along to that nature. Like, what are your thoughts and what are what are your thoughts oriented towards that? Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Please. I think that it's a horrible idea. I think it's a mostly charged political reaction to the things that are occurring in uh, in our communities all across the nation. Uh, I they don't the police departments don't have a pocket full of money that they're just uh, frivolously spending on on different things uh, just to inflict pain on on, uh, on people of color. It, it, the, uh, the issue is the culture of that particular police department that has to be addressed. A, uh, the law enforcement executives who are in charge of training the officers, who, who guide the behavior, who create the um, professionalism that's supposed to be uh, reflected when they go out and interact with the public, uh, following the procedures, understanding how to respect others' rights, um, these are all management issues and defunding the police is not going to solve the problem. It's going to make the problem worse because training costs money. The uh, adequate equipment costs money. One of the things uh, that a lot of people don't realize is that the reason why police departments get the lion's share of the budgets is because it is the only entity within any government that's 24 hours, seven days a week. Whenever you call the police, somebody better show up, somebody better answer, somebody, someone better provide service. Everybody else is eight to four or nine to five. And so um, it's not a money issue. It's a leadership issue. It's a culture issue. And um, the law enforcement executives need to be held accountable when those officers don't treat people the way they're supposed to be treated. And um, they, in addition to that, they should be uh, hiring those people or reprimanding them when they go outside the lines of or the scope of their authority and overstep their bounds and they, they uh, violate the rights of others. You know, I, I want to get... I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. What were you going to say? I was supposed to ask a follow-up question in terms of like proposing an alternative system of accountability then. Um, well, I, I tell you, I would love for James to get into that, but we're about ready to go over our time. And I, I think we could get into some policy issues the next time I would like you to come back on. Um, so maybe we can deep dive into specific policies because I think that question goes towards policy. Is that right, James? Yeah. And policy, is policy purposeful or is it political? It can be a little bit of both. It just depends on... Uh... It depends on the, the motive behind the policy. Um, unfortunately, in the police community, they don't create policy until something bad happens. And that's the reason why we as citizens need to hold our uh, elected officials and our law enforcement executives accountable. We should not wait till something bad happens before we decide to change a rule or to try to make the officers do a better job of uh, being police officers. You know, one of the things I, I, I working in politics and, and helping people uh, running campaigns is that there are three things that doesn't seem to always line up people, policy and purpose. Yes. If you can line them all three up, it's a home run. But a lot of the times people are left out. 
and it's always policy than purpose. You yes. know, the purpose, the policy is going to serve the purpose, but people never in there. And I think that's why so many people get hurt when it comes to a purpose and a policy. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I, I love this conversation. I just think we got we 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 have to have these hard conversations when it comes to police officers, administrative, um, leadership. I think it has a lot to do with leadership because yes. no matter how you look at it, an officer is going to do how they're led. Yes, absolutely. There's not too many rogues out there that's just going to be like, "Oh, the hell with chief, the hell with captain." The hell with my sheriff. I'm going to do what the hell I want to do on my own patrol. It's not going to happen. You know, Derek Chauvin would have never done what he had done to George Floyd if he didn't think he could get away with it. What happened to Rodney King happened to Rodney King because they thought they could get away with it. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Thank you so much. God bless, man. Anything you'd like to say before you take out of here? No, I thank everybody for tuning in. I hope I've, that I've been helpful and uh, hope to see you guys again soon. I enjoyed it. And uh, I think these conversations are healthy. And I think it's what we need is a black in the black community to be able to have a healthy dialogue so that we can create better solutions for the um, issues that face us uh, on a day to day basis. And so if we're going to uh, really enact real change, we're going to have to do more than just protest. We're going to have to hold the right people accountable and um, make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do to make things better for us. I want to thank everyone for joining me on Bridges Live. We're talking with the, um, uh, Sergeant James Spearman. And we'll be back. I will actually want to say next week or the week after, we're going to have a conversation with him. If you want to see the show, hear the show again, you can just put in Bridges Live, Dr. Paul Dyer, or go to my YouTube site or Facebook site, and you can see it there. Thank you, everyone, and get home safe, and God bless. God bless. Thank you.